Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Series. And this final summation vignette of the hip talks about the dreaded hip measurements. Nobody likes to measure anything. It's time consuming. But sometimes it can come in handy in unique situations and it becomes part of medical culture. One such measurement in the hip is the alpha angle. We'll talk about that as well as a few other measurement angles. Let's begin with some current considerations in femoroacetabular impingement. While we have talked about this entity, femoroacetabular impingement has often been broken down into FAI1, CAM type impingement, and FAI2, pincer type impingement. We know for a fact that there are many asymptomatic people that meet the measurement criteria for impingement, yet they have no symptoms. So measurements must be taken in the context of the clinical, individual, and the secondary findings on MR, such as erosions and inflammations and labral tears, but especially inflammation on the water-weighted sequence. Radiographically, when you're going to make measurements, because it's not a tomogram, the AP view is performed with the patient's supine. The central beam is directed to the midpoint between a line connecting both the anteroposterior iliac spines and the symphysis pubis. The sacroiliac joints to the symphysis distance is about 32 millimeters in men and 47 millimeters in women. Some of the key measurements you'll hear about are the lateral center edge angle of Weiberg or Weberg. This is normally greater than 20 to 25 degrees. The horizontal external or extern angle, which is usually less than 10 degrees. This one we'll ignore today. The posterior acetabular rim should lie medial to the center of the femoral head in an axial projection. This we'll share today. One such measurement is the center edge angle of Weiberg or Weberg. It quantifies the coverage or overcoverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum. There are two lines. They both begin in the center of the femoral head. One goes straight vertically, the other parallels the free bony edge of the acetabulum. Coverage is adequate if the angle is greater than 25 degrees. Coverage may be too great if the angle is too high. If the angle is greater than 39 to 44 degrees, we say there is coxa profunda. If the angle is greater than 44 degrees, we say there is protrusio acetabuli. So we can use this angle to assess under coverage or over coverage. Another measurement is the acetabular retroversion sign, also known as the crossover sign, in which the relationship between the anterior and posterior walls of the acetabulum are evaluated. For instance, in this cadaveric specimen in which the x-ray beam has been properly applied, the anterior wall will always lie mesial or medial to the posterior wall and they will never crisscross over each other. But in this situation, the anterior wall and posterior wall do make a crisscross or a loop. As they start to descend, they switch positions, and thus the crossover sign is elicited. I think you'll appreciate the crossover sign and have it better displayed with tomographic axial imaging. There are several signs that you can use to assess the presence of femoral acetabular impingement. These include the already discussed crossover sign, the ischial spine sign, the posterior wall sign, protrusio acetabuli, and coxa profunda. We have alluded to the phenomenon of acetabular retroversion, and this we'll revisit shortly. The issues of tracing the anterior and posterior acetabular wall were challenging with the more minified images you saw previously, but this magnified radiograph demonstrates the medial anterior wall the more lateral posterior wall, and they never cross over each other. This lack of crossover 
means that the posterior wall is positioned in a more lateral orientation. It forces the femoral head into slightly more of an anteverted position. If these two lines were to cross over each other, then the crossover sign would be manifest. And we would consider that the patient had acetabular retroversion. Let's break it down diagrammatically a little further. We're going to look at each of these phenomena one by one. Let's start out with coxa profunda. With the floor of the acetabular fossa depicted with a red line, there is overlap with the ilioischial line, which is a dashed line, the IIL, which you might have noticed on the last x-ray. This meets the criteria for coxa profunda. For protrusio acetabuli, the medial aspect of the femoral head depicted as a red line, overlaps the ilioischial line as a dashed line. In the crossover sign, we've already discussed how the posterolateral wall and the anteromedial wall will crisscross each other and make a figure of eight when they change positions in patients with FAI. In the posterior wall sign, the center of the femoral head depicted as a small red dot is located lateral to the posterior acetabular wall depicted as a red line. And finally, the ischial spine sign with the shape of the ischial spine protruding medially to the pelvic rim. Here's an example of a patient who demonstrates under coverage. If we were to perform a center edge angle, draw a line straight up vertical, and then a line along the edge of the bony acetabulum, which is right there, that angle would be well under 20 degrees. In other words, there would be insufficient coverage. The fact that the patient is symptomatic is obvious in that the muscles are not being used and demonstrate fatty infiltration, and there is marked narrowing of the lateral joint space and loss of hyaline cartilage. Fact. A 10-year follow-up shows that coxa profunda is associated with progression of osteoarthritis, but an even stronger association between coxa profunda and osteoarthritis together is noted. The alpha angle, initially measured anteriorly at 9 o'clock, then a radial plane is reconstructed, and the images, rather than the oblique axial plane images, are used to see the total femoral head circumference angled off of a sagittal. So the alpha angle will be acquired off of an oblique axial, but then you'll visually assess through a series of radial images that are acquired off of a sagittal the overall shape of the femoral head and neck in multiple radial orientations. Let's look at how we might obtain these radial orientations. Here's a sagittal demonstrating a labral tear in a patient with cam type impingement. A series of radial images will be obtained to look at the overall shape of the femoral head and the femoral neck. The dashed line represents just one of the many radial images that will be obtained. Here's an axial oblique image, which is used conventionally to measure the alpha angle. This, by the way, comes from one of the radial reconstructions that is more in an axial orientation, a paraxial. The alpha angle is measured thusly. A line is drawn bisecting the neck and extraarticular portion of the femur. It stops at the center of the femur. Where there is a transition point between the neck and the head, the second line is drawn. This angle is known as the alpha angle. An abnormal alpha angle is seen when there is greater than 65 degrees of this measurement. This line, as you can see, always bisects this distance and this distance just lateral to the circle, which is the femoral head. So D divided by 2 and D divided by 2 should be equal to make this line. Our patient has a through and through 
labral tear without a paralabral cyst. This is a transverse oblique sonogram demonstrating the transition between the neck and the head. A little bit of thickening as we come up to the head-neck junction, consistent with early bumps in cam type impingement. Here are the same bumps seen on a radial paraxial reconstruction in the femoral head-neck junction, so-called loss of sphericity, so-called loss of tapering as a sign of cam type impingement. Here's another way to acquire alpha angle measurements. You can get an oblique axial or paraoblique off of a coronal and then make the same measurements bisecting the long axis of the femur. The second angle is made at the femoral head neck junction where there is normal tapering between the head and the delicate thin neck. The angle is well under 55 degrees. In the abnormal state, because of the bump, the angle is altered. It's widened. It approaches 90 degrees, with normal being less than 55 or 60 degrees. Now remember, not everyone with an abnormal alpha angle is going to have the symptoms of FAI. You have to take the case in total with the clinical syndrome and with the secondary signs of labral pathology anterior hyaline cartilage erosion, effusion, hyaline cartilage thinning, coup injuries, contra coup injuries, and so on. Here's a coronal. This coronal has a slight oblique to it so that we're catching the long axis of the neck and the intertrochanteric structures and the head all at the same time. So really it's a paracoronal. Here too, we can make the same types of measurements. We can bisect the femur from the center of the femoral head going down. So this D divided by 2 and this D divided by 2 are equal. And then draw our transition point between the head and the neck. The angle is less than 55 degrees normal. Here with a bump, the angle is well over 55 degrees in a patient with CAM type FAI. Well, this concludes our measurement discussion. I think there are three takeaways from this discussion. The alpha angle is measured off of a paracoronal or a paraoblique. Some techniques for its measurement are given, and a normal is less than 55 to 60 percent. It is used as a sign of femoral acetabular impingement type 1 or CAM impingement, but by itself does not mean the patient has clinical CAM impingement. Second takeaway, the easy angle to measure is the center edge angle. If it is too small, there is femoral head under coverage. If it is too large, there is femoral head over coverage. And I showed you a series of diagrams to help you understand the crossover sign, acetabular retroversion, Normal physiologic acetabular antiversion, coxa profunda, protrusio acetabuli, protrusion of the ischial spine. All of these can be used to assess the status and dynamic relationships of the femoral head in a patient, provided you correlate it with the patient's clinical syndrome and other secondary signs. Thank you.